Reggae Uprising with your host, Daniel. Greetings, Reggae Uprising family. I am very excited about today's episode as my guest embodies everything that Reggae Uprising is about. I am going to play the first track that she has selected, Sitting by the Wayside by Tony. Washington. mother, grandmother, poet, creative writer, author, TV and radio presenter. She has recently won two awards for her BBC TV documentary, The First Black Brummies. Her spoken word and music collective is called Rhythm Chant and she's currently working on an EP. I am very thankful that this very busy and inspirational woman has taken the time to come and talk to the Reggae Uprising family. I would like to introduce Sue Brown. Greetings and welcome, Sue. Greetings and thank you for, you know, inviting me to come. It's just amazing. <laughs> Firstly, um, why did you pick that track? The first track, um, Sitting by the Wayside. I remember you know, the first time I heard it was back in the 70s, about 74, 75, and I was about 14 or 15 years old. I love instrumental music. My dad was a jazz musician, and this kind of has a flavor of kind of jazz and reggae. Um, so it's been almost like a signature tune um, throughout from my teens right up until now. And I'm very fortunate to say that the, um, the producer uh, the, 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 of this particular track um, I met him somewhere in the 90s, I think it was. Um, I was working on a video production and we met. And we're friends still. But he's also the producer for Millie Small, My Boy Lollipop and Louisa Marks. Um, he's writer, producer and plays the music for them. So, and we're still good friends. And um, I'll always, I'll always um, shout out that track. As I do with all of my guests, as we're people of the diaspora and my listeners are from all over the world, could you share your heritage with all of us? Okay, my I was born here in Birmingham, uh, UK, and both my parents are from Jamaica. Yeah, both my parents are from Jamaica. Mm. Growing up, did you feel you had to seek out your traditions um, from your heritage or were they part of your household? Definitely. Yeah, it's a little mix of the two, but definitely the Jamaican household. So my um, my mother died when I was five, so it was just my dad who brought us up. And my younger sisters, you know, from three to 18 months, we were just brought up by my dad. And he was like, he would say, yes, he's a Jamaican. And he had um, a very strong identity that he did not want to let go of. However, he would say, well, no born in England, so any English people... You know, he would say these things and was like, what? But in the home, everything was Jamaican. Um, obviously, when we left the home outside, going to school, we'd embrace or be involved with things that my dad would call English. Because when it comes to food, um, my dad was a good cook. He was a great cook, actually. And so he had his way of cooking and preparing. I mean, everything I have to wash, everything I have to clean, everything like this. And, you know, we'd watch things on TV, um, a cookery program and my dad will say look how oh, them not even wash the meat and them I cook it things like this you know when we got to school um, we had cookery lessons and they did things very differently um, from how we were used to um, music was the m big part of our um, upbringing and like I said my dad was a jazz musician but also played um, reggae loved reggae so in the home we had that constantly in the home and we always had house parties 
Um, and again, watch TV and you'd see Top of the Pops and you'd see all these different kinds of music. So that was a little different. But um, so my dad also talked about um, things that, you know, um, stories about Jamaica all the time. So I almost felt that we knew Jamaica because we constantly, it was always in the house. He told us about Marcus Garvey. He told us about, you know, in my teens when I was, we were looking at Bob Marley on, on TV and he said, no, he said, well... You know, Rasta, because I don't know why he couldn't say Rasta. But anyway, Rasta, when I was a boy, you know, the man them live up in the hills and you couldn't even go up in the hills and you boot them, you have to take them off. And so he would tell us about that. So we, we were well introduced to that, um, secular to everything else. Um, we, my, my dad, um, his family was from um, Salvation. He was brought up in a Salvation Army kind of uh, Christian belief. But... So Christianity was a kind of an air within the home, but we and we went to church Sunday school occasionally, but not um, not in the way some of my friends did actually. Mm. Are there any sayings um, that were said as a child that you still say now? Maybe you said to your children. Yeah, things like um, oh, just crazy things like when something's not right, I say what I'm doing. And I can clearly see what's going on. And I don't know why I asked the question. Because I remember when my dad would say, so what happened to you? <laughs> and I'm like, but you can see it. <laughs> so it's not right. So I say things like that. Um, um, oh, gosh, there's so much. Maybe I should have thought should have thought of this. Um, at the top of my head, I can't think. But those things that my dad would say, I still say. And when you say those things, mm. did your dad pop into your head? Always, you? always. <laughs> see, my, my, my dad passed away in uh, 2003. And I have now six grandchildren. And the way my children and I talk about my dad every single day, I think they don't think that he's passed away because it's like, well, dad said this and dad did that. To the point that even yesterday, my, my daughter, she said to me, um, she had a dream. Um, my dad had come to her in a dream. And he told her about this jazz song called Red Sails in the Sunset. But she didn't know it was called that. And she was, try she was trying to recall what it was. And then when she said it, red sails. She said it was something to do with red and the sh say, um, river. I said, red sails? In the she said, yes. I said, well, the message is in the song then. So, yes. Yeah, so we still talk to my dad all the time. All the time. Mm. So we like us as even the grandchildren. I'm sure they don't think that he's passed on. They just think he's physically here. Yeah. Oh, my dad used to say, Suna left me, you know, and I'm not going to leave him. So, yeah. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Some powerful, powerful words. Um, the next song that you picked is A Black Woman by Judy Mowat. Your reason for this selection? Powerful, powerful. So Judy Mowat was one of the I3s, Bob Marley and the I3s. And um, I can't recall when the, the track came out. Um, but obviously in the 70s, and it blew me away, the melody, her voice, obviously the words, you know, and to hear a song um, and telling our story from a perspective that I recognised and understood, and it was just beautifully delivered. I just thought, yes, black woman, and yes, the struggle still continues, and, um, but at least you can look at it as a reference point to see why we are the way we are, but also from the struggle, there is a way forward, you know, but you have to know, um, as, as the term says, Sankofa, you have to look back so that you know where you're going f to move forward. Mm. Wow, what an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go with Black Woman by Judy Moat. Black woman, ooh, black woman, like me a through your industry what obstacles have you come across along the way okay so um 
I started writing in my 30s, actually. So that in industry, the creative writing industry, I didn't know previous to that. There were poets that I knew of, like uh, Muta, Muta Baruka and Linton and, and, and Louise Bennett, but I never associated them with myself. I never thought that I was a poet. I never wrote a poem, as far as I know, that I can recall, and literally wrote something um, in my 30s. And within months, I was taking part in an, I took part in my first performance poet, uh, poetry event, and I'd never even been to one before. Um, at that time, I re and it still is, it is, it is male-dominated, um, for whatever reason, it is, it, it, it's male-dominated. And then, um, so I was looked to hear the, the female voice, or try to find the balance, because just like you need the, just like you, you have words, you need the mouth to speak. So with the male and female, you, you, we can collectively tell our story. And sometimes it can be just um, one-sided. So, um, especially because the type of person that I was, um, I was very um, shy, even in my 30s. Um, so I'd, I'd struggle a little to be in certain environments um, and then to, to, to say what I had to say. But um, to be fair, uh, people like um, Makapi Selassie and um, Martin Glynn and so many others have so encouraged me and supported me um, along the way. So at first, I think the struggles that I may have come across were my own struggles, my own fears, my lack of confidence, but they were there to support me on that. Um, the wider industry, I have been fortunate that... Um, People have come to see me perform and they have wanted me to perform and take part in their events and that's still going right now. So I give thanks for that, you know, but the support has always been there. You know, um, on a wider industry, there is racism and sexism out there, but I, you know, I try and keep focused and do what I have to do and recognize that, um, I have a purpose. If I have to open my mouth, I have, there is something that something is going to come out that's um, positive, and it's part of the development of myself and others. Mm. When you come across those obstacles that you've just talked about, mm -hmm. um, is there um, a certain mantra or something that you say to yourself in order to deal with those when those um, you come across those mm -hmm. obstacles? Well, as I said to you, I always think that my dad is with me. I know that he's there. So I imagine if he was there, what would he say? Yeah. So I can't okay. say what he would say because the language would be just like, what? But <laughs> <laughs> that was, he would like, you know, but at the same time, we were fortunate again that my dad had faith in us. He was... He just felt that, yes, you could be a judge, you could be a barrister, you could be this, you could be that. He, but he also said, if you wanted to be a road sweeper, make sure it's something that you want to do and do your best. As long as you want to do it and you're good at it, you know. So the mantra in my head is that if I'm going to open my mouth, I'm going to do something, do my best. Yeah, and that's how I do it. Okay, okay. I think I've already got a vibe of your inspiration, but were there poets that inspired you or writers that inspired you to first get into that field? Did you see a performance or? Yeah, so I'd, I never saw, like I said, I never saw a performance till I, till I wrote my first poem, I think, till I'd written yeah, my first couple of poems. Um, but the poets I'd seen um, were dub poets and um, from Jamaica, like I said, Muta Baruka, you know, and no way in my head that I even imagined that I even had words or anything that would be, I would be sharing. So somewhere in my psyche, I'm, um, I was being prepared. And my dad was a good storyteller also, you know. So in my nurturing, it must have been within me, but I didn't know till I reached um, in my 30s and then that was it and it came out then. There were a few women, um, like I said, it just seemed to be male dominated, so there wasn't that many. but. Once I'd started performing, I'm hearing different people and listening to different things. I also liked um, to hear spoken word with jazz. Oh, especially the upright bass. I just was like, that just blew my mind. Um, I think I liked the voice, the tone of the voice with an instrument, as, because your voice is an instrument, but it's finding that tone as well to say what you're saying. So it resonates. And um, we have a vibration our vibration and we're in tune to that and um 
So there are certain sounds and feelings that work for me. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Wow. Um, do you ever get stage fright? Or did you have stage fright and you haven't got it now? Or um, It wasn't so much stage fright. I was, I was more conscious, and I still am more, um, sometimes I could be a little anxious about what is it that I'm saying. So I could have one or a thousand people. The, the audience doesn't phase me. It's just that, what am I saying? I, am I saying what I need to be saying? That's, that's what I think about more than it. So is this worth sharing with anyone? And will they overstand it? Will they um, get the message? Am I doing my best? That's what I think about. So when I first started performing, I never heard myself, never heard myself for about a year and a half. I could hear my voice, but it never touched me, never, you know, because all I thought about was performing it. So recite it, say it, get on there, and that's it. And um, one day I heard my voice. And I think the, everyone was, I think they heard it the same time I heard it to me because I, I stopped because I literally heard my voice. I went, wow, wow. So I could hear what others were saying because there's a sound, the way I speak, there's a sound that I have. Um, and I heard it then and I was impressed. I was well impressed. Um, and I think for that first year and a half, the practicing and, um, you know, was really helping me. But then I'm also working with musicians. I was a little nervous about working with them because once you start, them start. And if I make a mistake, oh my gosh, then I'm going to have to stop and all this kind of thing. So sometimes I'd get anxious about that. But not so much, not so much about the audience in that kind of way. That, that didn't phase me. Mm -mm. Okay. Mm. Okay. And um, were you ever anxious, say, that you wrote something that was quite raw or close to your heart or your emotions? were kind of you let them out on a page and mm -hmm. then you had to perform them did that make you more anxious or was it like was it cathartic was it a release yes it was a release because I have lots of things going in on my head and for me that uh, to try and work out what it is that I'm feeling and trying to having it written down I can read it back to myself and think well yes this is what I'm actually saying most of the work that I started writing were more about social commentary about us as a people and our situation and um, <laughs> I remember I was at the library theatre, which isn't here, not far from where we are now, the old library theatre. And um, everyone came off stage. The musicians were packing up to come off stage. And this man came on the stage, this white man came on the stage, and he said to me, the poems that you're, um, you're sharing with us, people don't need to hear about that. So I said, what? Mm. What do you mean? Mm. I said, I knew what he meant. I said, um, why? He says, well, the masses don't need to hear that. So I said, and? He says, well, you know, if you continue, you will have people come and visit you. Mm, yeah. What? Mm. He said, do people come and visit you like myself? So I said, um, so why are you here then? And he said, you know, I heard about Sue Brown, so I just wanted to come in here for myself. Wow. And I know. Um, uh, what did he say? Yeah, come in here. For so I said, so what do you want me to write about? I said, do you want me to write about the bees, the birds and the bees or something? He just shr shrugged his shoulder. He said, I'm just telling you. So I said, well, you know, I must be doing something right because I'm sure this is what Bob Marley must have come, ac come across. And you know what the man said? Well, look where he is now. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Mm. So that happened a few times. And the thing is, in my, to me... What I'm saying isn't about, isn't anything very different from anyone else. It isn't. But he told me, it wasn't that it was different. It was that people listen. Mm -hmm. That's the Because you're powerful. It, yeah. So he said, you, could, you know, everyone can be saying the same thing. But in your voice and your delivery and the type of person you are, some people switch off. They won't listen to that particular, even though the message is strong and right. But then you, if you have um, charisma, if you have a personality that can connect, that's where the problem is. And so, anyway, I just continue to write and do what I have to do. It's just that. I suppose it just goes with the territory. If you're, you know, a powerful person, you have a lot of light, you're sur mm -hmm. surrounded by a lot of mm -hmm. light, you're going yeah. so you to come across a lot of darkness from people yes. because they see it as a threat. It, it does. And, and then I think, well, you know, they, they're only here to do what they have to do. I have to do what I have to do. 
Um, because if, you know, he felt and others have felt they need to come and approach me and tell me this, then that's what they have to do. I just have to focus on what I have to do. You know, obviously keep myself safe, but it is a reality, you know, and I've been approached maybe another <laughs> another time we could look at that, but I've been approached by various organizations, societies, let's say, to be a part of their society. And I'm just saying, you know, I have to do what I have to do. That's it, you know. Mm. Okay, well, speaking of Bob Marley, mm -hmm. um, another track that you picked was Running Away. Hey. <laughs> Any particular reason for this selection? Yes, the, the, the album, the Kaya album, uh, and I bought it when I was, I don't know, 16 or something. I was, I was always buying records, always, and I still do buy, you know, music. And that one, I'd listened to the one side of the album all evening. And it was late in the evening, about 10 o'clock. I'd flip the, the album, because that time, on the turntable, uh, when I heard this, you're running away, running away from yourself. It's something in it that just said, I don't know, it just touched me at that time. And it always has. And I think it's really hard for people to say sometimes what's their favorite, favorite track of a particular artist. And I would say that's definitely one of my favorite Bob Marley tracks, Running Away. And as a musical piece, I just think it's phenomenal as well. should hear it as a jazz piece as well. Wow. Okay, beautiful. Well, here we go with Bob Marley running away. I'd like to know more about your works. We've touched on it a, a little bit um, in terms of your poetry. Um, your other works, could you tell us a little bit more about your All other right. works? So up until 2018, I was a family support worker at a local children's centre. I was there for about, I was there for about seven years. Absolutely love being a family support worker. And you're working with families with children between um, birth and, and five years old. Birmingham City Council decided to, in their wise self, decided to cut the children's centres. So in Birmingham, they cut 26 round about one time. And those that remained, one of our centres, were taken over by um, various charities. I um, wasn't feeling it, and that transition, and, and decided to leave. And I put in my notice. And so when I had said to them I would, I would like to take VR, um, voluntary redundancy, within two weeks of saying that, putting it out there into the universe. The BBC contacted me to tell me about a program they're making. And if I would help them with their research, I did that. Then they contacted me again and um, about some more research stuff. Met with the producer again and um, we went on a, a meeting We had some with some people. And uh, he just said to me, you know what, I think you should present the program. I couldn't believe it. I said, I have never presented. I've never been on TV, nothing like this. He says, no, I think you should. And at first I was protesting and I was saying, can I just do the voiceover? Because then you don't have to see me. Uh, he was like, no, 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 I think you should present this. So then I really thought, well, he wouldn't ask me if he felt I couldn't do it. And, um, and it would be a waste of money, a waste of time. So I said, okay. Um, three weeks into filming, you know, he said, you know what, you should do the vo narrative as well, the voiceover for the program as well. So I did that. Um, and the good thing about that was that you, c you get to see the edit, which is what I wanted to see, the final edit, 
because I had said to them in the making of programs, B the BBC as well as uh, many other organizations don't always represent us right. And I'm feeling a little bit unsure. I have invited other people to be part of this. And then we're going to watch it one day and think, whoa, we never said it like that. Or, you know, because of the, the way it was edited. But I, Ed Barlow, I can't, I can't praise him enough. He was phenomenal. So since then, I've done a number of um, uh, other programs, including radio. Radio 4 presented that. Um, I'm in the middle of putting a um, couple of proposals to various production companies as well, working on one right now. No, working on three right now. Mm, one of them's wow. radio, I know. So, um, but also, um, I'm also working with other art forms, as in photography, because I'm looking to work uh, creative writing and photography. A photographer who lives in Canada confirmed on Friday that he's coming in the year and we're going to run a project together. So there are a number of different things that I'm working on. So it's all around the creative side. So the creative writing, a little in TV, radio, etc. cetera. Mm. Okay, so um, the transition from your previous job to um, all of the things that you do now, <laughs> um, was that hard to make that transition? Because when it comes to creative professions, a lot of times people see them as like hobbies. They don't see them as real mm -hmm. jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so even though I was a family support worker, I, I continued creative writing workshops. Occasionally performance poetry, but the creative writing workshop, I continued, I work for an organization, freelance for an organization called Writing West Midlands. So they put on the literature event within the Midlands, big event, and I've been working with them for more than 15 years. Um, uh, but the last project I had with them, it was at the Royal, um, um, in Stratford-upon-Avon, yeah, the Royal Shakespeare Centre. So working down there for three years, running uh, creative writing workshops. And the young people came from all around the UK, basically, for my workshops. Um, so I've always been, you know, I've always worked with that as a freelance. It's just now um, I'm just it's stepping up. I'm doing a little bit more because I'm not in a regular paid job, whereas family support, that's what I was doing for a while. Um, so the transition wasn't so, so dramatic or anything. The thing that was dramatic was being in front of the camera. That is dramatic. <laughs> that that was dramatic. Um, since the program was made, you know, I've won I won two television awards for that program, and my role in it. Um, the program is excellent. Can't fault it. Everyone in there. <sighs> but you know how it is. Sometimes you look at yourself and you say, "My gosh, no way!" <laughs> you know, I said to the director, "Why have we got them big close up?" <laughs> <of my friends?" laughs> <laughs> you know, oh. so, but. Um, and I think that's just about me being in front of camera. Um, so yeah, what so. was that like on the first day? You said you'd never done anything like that before. Like uh, you got all these people looking at you. Yeah. Like, so did you was it intimidated? It, well, what they did, I, I, to, again, to be fair, Ed, they came to my house and filmed a number of sequences in the house. And I think part of that was getting me used to being in front of the camera. So it was in my own setting, you know, and um, they're very good. They're ve they were very, very good, the cameraman and, and Dave, uh, Ed. Um, so then when we went out on road now, starting to film and people were walking past, you know, I guess I felt a little bit nervous and I did have a script, but um, there was a part where he just said, okay, this is what I'd like you to, to say in your own words, and he'd written it down. It was about four lines. Could I read it? Could I read it? Could I even remember it? Oh, <laughs> gosh, I was so embarrassed. It was about 50 million takes, and I couldn't, I couldn't, I could not do it. The cameraman was saying, don't worry, because he says, you see all those professionals on TV? He says, you don't know how many takes it took them to do it. And I'm looking, I'm thinking, four lines, Sue, and you can't even, I struggled. But um, we got there in the end, we did, you know. Um, it was a good experience. I liked it, um, but I think being behind the camera is a bit, I would prefer still. Oh, so you haven't got the bug for it now? Like you no, no, I mean, obviously, um, uh, then I did Inside Out, the program, there's a program called Inside Out, 
um, that was a that was a um, <clears throat> a television idea, a program idea of mine. It was looking at stately homes, slavery, the connection to slavery and stately stately homes, and why is it as us as a people, black people in particular, we don't really go to visit them for what? Because we sometimes feel that it's nothing to do with us. It's all these rich people, da da da. But majority of them made their money out of slavery. So of in my book, of course, we have every right to run up and down and go and have a look and just say yes. You know, um, so we made that program. I made that program. Again, that was that was slightly different. It was a different production company who are phenomenal also. But it's just being in front of camera. I'm still working, working on that one, you know. But the narration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can do <laughs> All day long. All day long. <laughs> Radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> I do want to get on to um, more about your documentaries, um, but we're going to play another tune. It's called Second Chance by Lila Ike. And why did you pick this tune? So the rhythm is an Aswad track. And Lila, um, I, I think she's been singing. She's a young woman. She's been singing maybe a few years now. She's come in with a vibe and I think absolutely beautiful, raw um it's just, it's golden, actually. And her voice with this Aswad track works beautifully. I'm not sure if she wrote the, 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 the piece herself. I think she did. But I'm well impressed, and I love it. And when I hear people like Coffee and Leila and others, I'm saying, yeah, we still have, we still got things to do, and we can do them well. So that's why I chose the track. Okay, here we go with Second Chance by Leila Ike. My baby tell me that he's leaving today I say he can't take the stress My baby told me that he's going away I say he's bound to find the best I tell him I'm the best That's out there He said that he no longer cares Hey, oh baby, please Beg me off, I beg you just a second chance can we fall in love like we did before? Can I show you how much I adore you, babe? Come make me go fall in love. Know you love the style, especially the robot. Right, so when you were doing um, your filming mm -hmm. for the first Black Brummies, mm -hmm. um, who would you say was the most inspiring person that, you're in, that you interviewed and why was it their story? Um, what did they have to say that, I suppose, in, inspired you? So each, every one, every person I interviewed inspired me, everyone. Most of them I knew. Most of them, I, as part of that research, that when the BBC contacted me, I contacted them, I found them. Because I knew not only did they have a story to tell, that they would present and be articulate enough to bring the story to the camera. Was there any stories that you didn't know about before you interviewed? Um, obviously, you knew the people that you interviewed. Were they yeah, most the of them I knew. There was, there was only one um, scene we had. It was filmed at the library, Birmingham Central Library, in the archives. And um, <clears throat> we were looking at, um, I think, the, the photos, photo collection in the archives of um, black people who have donated or given photos to the library. Um, some of the stories I didn't know about them. There was, um, oh gosh, the, the photographer's name has gone out my head. He used to be on Soho Road. Um, the, 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 the historian was telling me that some people, black people, We'll go to the um, photographers and borrow the clothes to take photos, really nice clothes, and those photos would be sent home to the Caribbean to give the impression that things were nice. Okay. Now, uh, many of the photos that I know, they're what I assumed most people, is their own clothes and stuff, but it never crossed my mind that some people would, would do that at that time. It never crossed my mind. I can see why. But I didn't know that. I, did, I, I wasn't aware of that. Um, he said not all of them, but some people did because they wanted to give the impression, yeah, things are right here in England, you know. And that, and, and I, to a degree, I think most people do that. And we still do it today. We go to take photos and we put on the best or we look the way we, because we want to present an image. I think especially at that time in the 50s and 60s, although times were really difficult and hard and 
they didn't want to feel as though they made a mistake or things were that bad and, and that. So they tried to give a little bit of a hope, show a bit of hope in those photos. And the, the, I think that was probably the only thing that I didn't realize, wasn't aware of before. Mm. How do you feel about um, the politics of, it's quite a big question, the politics of the Windrush generation, them coming over, how they've been dealt with? Mm -hmm. I know it's a big question, but just to know your thoughts in well, a small way. I suppose the Windrush is just one of many issues mm -hmm. that has been going on since we were since we were kidnapped from the land of Africa. So every generation, there is something going on, some scenario, something that, you know, someone's really taken advantage of our situation. And the Windrush, part of that were, was, was um, those in control couldn't care less, didn't want to recognize yeah. us. And it had conflicts with those few who did yeah, because I'm not saying everybody was like that. I know everyone is that way. But within the system, the system is set up and it's designed to do what it's, it has to do. So when people came here under the disguise, under the, um, well, they were invited. So England's mush up now after the war and everything. So please come and you're part of the British Commonwealth. Come and help us, this, that, that. Like during the war, many Caribbean people took part in the war, fighting in, 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 the, in the war, right? flying airplanes, bombers, all the rest of it. But that wasn't told to the masses. Just like the man who came and told me, I don't need to tell the masses my story. So things were kept. So during the war, people took part. After the war, they went back to the Caribbean. England's now mush up, so they want people to come and rebuild. Because I don't know what's going on with the people here. I don't know why they can't fix up their place. I don't know. So anyway, they import, tell, tell everybody to come and fix up the place. And then general people now, ordinary people, weren't used to seeing black people on road, walking up and down, doing this. And then uh, I suppose it's the same like as it is now with those refugees. People get anxious and think that people are going to come and take their little space and their that. Um, so that's where the conflict would, 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 would surface. And within the system, there is one reason why the British invited us here. But then there are those who saw, well, they helped with the war, they financed this, they've done this, they've done that. They should be here, we should be here. So this is where conflicts happen. And things that should have been in place weren't. And, and some, um, in some circumstances, we weren't even documented as being here. So that um, at that, that time, people came on their parents, children came on their parents' passport, but there was no evidence to prove that they were on the passport. So if the passport was destroyed or lost, there was no recollection of them being here legally. So later on in life, when they're, as adults now, they're applying for their passport. This is when the British are saying, or the system saying, how, do, how come you're here? How did you get here? And they say, yeah, I came with my parents on my parents' passport. But there was no evidence of that. Uh, but they did have the evidence. They did. In a certain degree, they did. But because we weren't looked upon as worth, it wasn't worth keeping that kind of information. And it came back on them. And it's an ongoing thing. In my book, it's an ongoing thing. There'll always be some issue somewhere. Always. Definitely. That, Like you said, the Windrush is just a small paragraph yes. in a massive book. Yes, of it's ongoing. Yeah. You know, right now, you know, yesterday and today, they're looking at um, the Holocaust the Jews, 75 years, blah, blah, blah. And I'm saying, yes, rightfully so. But no one wants to touch on our situation like that. No one, because it's a, it's too big. It's too big. And the whole country is and set up on And there's too much that. money involved. It's too much Let's money. Let's not forget that. Too much money. Yeah. And the biggest thing is to say, yes, we did wrong. It was wicked and terrible, and it's ongoing. So it's almost like that saying about opening a can of worms, which I don't quite get myself, that saying, but anyway, opening a can of worms, because it's way too big, you know? And um, so it, the, that's what I'm saying, until, until they sort themselves out, but more importantly, until we recognize who we are and start to remember who we are, things will always be the same. You know, we live in a world where we're trying to assimilate into something, anything, in fact, other than us and other than to be who we are. We tend to be looking outward and onwards to other peoples and other cultures and other societies. And there's some beautiful things going on there. But we turn our back on who we are. 
and then we get lost and struggle and we have things like mental health, identity crisis, the whole heap of things um, because we can't look inwards, can't face it, we struggle. So because of the kind of works that you do um, within your poetry, within the documentaries that you've put out, mm -hmm. do you have you do you think you come across more obstacles because of the kind of content, because of the subject matter that you're trying to put out there, like you were just saying about the media trying mm -hmm. to distract from mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. you're kind of bringing it back? Yes, and you just have to keep on just do what you have to do. Um, one of our issues is that we don't have our own outlets. So we're constantly going to somebody else to say, this is my idea, this is my thoughts, these are our stories. But we go to someone else to put them on TV or whatever because we don't necessarily have our own outlets to do that. So we have to do, or I have to do what I have to do in my own means and my own ways. Yes, so if they're saying, yes, Sue, come in, man. So what ideas do you have for us? And I'll be like, yeah, you okay? Let me tell you. And if they say yes, they say yes. If they say no, I will ask them, why not? Tell me why not. Well, because X, Y, Z. Okay, well, let me tell you about X, Y, Z, because there's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, why we should be doing this. So the few things that you're saying, no. And, and it's also from their perspective. I said, because you don't recognize there are other people, others out there who have something to say. So it's just working with it. And so I just have to do what I have to do. So has there ever been instances where they've said no because it's just too uncomfortable? The viewers just will find that too uncomfortable. It's not PC. It's not. They haven't said that. No, no. they haven't said that. Mm -mm, mm -mm. I would like them to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, bet you would. I, would, I would like them to tell me that one. I'll be like, okay, that's cool because that's right. Because then we can reason on it. Because if they don't know, some of them know. If they don't know, they don't know. Oh, so, so if I present an idea and it's like, well, I'm not sure, you know, because of the audience and this, that, that. Let's, let's, as they say, break it down. Tell me how. I watch TV. I'm one of those audience members. It's something that I would like to see. And people that I know, this is what I definitely know, this is what they like to see and hear. So we can go through, the, through, through that. Um, yeah, so. Okay, let's move on to your next song, mm -hmm. Lightning by Mortimer. Why have you chosen this one? So again, this is this is a love um, a love song by Mortimer. Mortimer again, I think he's a fairly new artist, probably been going a few years now, and um, I think hearing him, he has he has he's in a space that I like. I can feel he's going to come with more and greatness. Um, again, like Coffee and Layla and Chronix and Protégé, I think he's in that field there with them. And I like the rawness of him, how he looks. And um, I think the, the, those who I've told you about, the, the music that you're playing, there is a naturalness about them. It doesn't seem forced. It, they're not they're not looking a particular way because it's how they need to be looked. So, so if they're saying, if they say Rastafari, it's not they're not presenting a look that stereotypical as Rastafari. Mm -hmm. So there is a naturalness that I, 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 I like and feel inspired by. Yeah, that's why. And I think it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful track. And if you get to see the video as well. In fact, all of the tracks that I've said, if you can see the video, mm -hmm, they're saying something. Mm. Right, <laughs> here we go with Lightning by Mortimer. Your love struck me down, lightning, thunder in my soul, baby. My heart beats for you only. Every word is true. I'm in love with you. Take you as you are, lady. You ain't got a change for me. Need you from your crown, honey. Right down to the sole of your very feet Girl, my love grows stronger each day, baby, please Don't hurt me just because you know I forgive Girl, my love grows stronger each day, baby Hurt me just because you know I forgive. 
Right. Now, as a person of the diaspora, what journeys have you been on to discover more about your roots? Every day, every day you discover something, whether we consciously know it or not. Um, and like I said, with my upbringing, my dad always told us about Jamaica, always spoke about Jamaica, so we have that connection. And my siblings still live in Jamaica. They never came across, they never came here, so they were brought up in Jamaica. And now we kind of connect in that kind of way. So the connection is there with Jamaica and stuff. Um, like I said, my dad told us about Rastafari and Africa and from the little that he, 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 he understood or understood. And then when I was in my teen, um, I was at school, 14, 15, the program called Roots came out. That kind of mush up the world because it was like, what? This, is, this was a present, the way it was presented, you saw us in a particular way now as, as, as um, people that were physically stolen from a land and tricked. I remember the next day we went to school. Nobody wanted to talk to nobody. Everybody felt uncomfortable. It was, my, it was, it was a weird feeling. Um, and that interested me. And again, we're listening to Rastafari music as well because in the, 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 the artists like um, Winston Rodney, Burning Spear, I didn't put him as a selection, but he's probably one of my greatest um, artists too. It, it, he had a track called, Do You Remember the Days of Slavery? Oh my gosh, I used to play the album and, and hear and, and, and learn from what he was saying. So by the time my teens now, I'm listening to poets like Muta Baruch and about self-awareness and who we are. So it has always been there, that, that self-awareness and finding, um, trying to find out who I am. But at that time, I was looking outwardly. Yes, finding the research, finding this, do da do da about that. And it's later on in life I start to look within myself. Basically, the question is, who am I? And I wrote maybe a couple of poems that, that the title is, Who Am I? Because what I think I am and who I am may not be quite the same. Yeah? Because we're informed by our environment and what people label you as and this, that, that. So I'm still on that journey, you know, as to say, who am I? So the finding yourselves and your roots, it's, it's a combination of many things. You know, but as my friend keeps reminding me, Prudencia, we are spiritual beings having the earthly experience, you know, and um, it can be a challenge sometimes, you know, but it's all good. It's good still. Mm. I'm intrigued now and you know I'm going to ask you. Okay. I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah. Would you mind performing that? The Who Am I? Yeah. I don't remember it. Oh, oh. no. I mean, if you had told me, I would have... <laughs> it I, just, it yeah. just sat, I'm just yes. intrigued, you yes. know what I mean? So I just thought... All right, um, I could say... All right, there's another poem. It's called Seek the Knowledge. Um, I can say part of that then. It says, human beings in becoming new beings seek the knowledge of the truth. Recognize your powers of creativity. Re-evaluate the purpose of your existence. Reopen your mind. Seek the knowledge of the truth. Know and understand the value of who you are. Learn where you have traveled from. Find the pathway to that which is right. Regenerate your rhythms of life. Miseducate is only to mislead, imprisoning your great potential. Mental and spiritual slavery keeps consciousness in bondage. Energies focused upon self-hate, disunity, values, disrespecting life's worth only equals destruction for yourself and your nation. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. Mm -hmm. Powerful is an understatement. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Um, so if I wanted to hear more of yes. that, where would I find more All of right. your work? So there's currently um, an anth a book out, a book of poems out called Rhythm Chant. I think it's available, as they say, online and Waterstones and stuff. So we haven't done the book launch for that, so it's still new, new, new. And then also I work with a guitarist, Anthony Williams, and together we are called Rhythm Chant. Um, we're working, as you said, as an EP, and we're hoping that's out by March. Mm. So once those are out, we will have launch and, and a number of events. Um, performance poetry. Um, at the top of my head, I haven't got anything going on as yet. More creative writing workshops. But there is an event that um, I'm, I'm part of. A, yes, 
it was called Mango, it was at a, a club called Mango Lounge, um, Wednesday Mike Fever. We've been doing this for three and a half years over. And it's where we have spoken word, music, etc. And occasionally I would perform myself there. Are there any changes in the world that you would like to see for 2020? The change, is ta- change starts with self. Everything starts with self. And find and seek the, that, that knowledge of who you are, the better, the, the, the higher realm of who you are. And then from that perspective, so say you and I are, are, are here now, we're reasoning. And in your, in, your, in your glory, in your beauty, in your essence, we would connect. So everything else around us will also rise, especially as women as well. Black women, the power is within. Power is in everyone. But with black women, we need to remind ourselves. You know, I remember at school, we were looking at, slavery and they were saying many of the plantation owners right we're on the plantation working in the fields and yet they would get the black women to breastfeed their children if we were less than human beings because we were property why would you want a black woman to feed nurture your child with her milk even though we were barely alive ourselves they knew the nourishment they knew everything that was within our body was still there and it's still and it's still right today but we we have forgotten. We have forgotten. They haven't forgotten. We have forgotten. It's about us remembering and reconnecting with who we are. Yeah. Definitely. I feel like the more we connect with each other, we yes. all hold different we facets. Do. Which we, do. we do. We do. Ourselves that we can help yeah. each other. And it's about rising. So start with yourself. Change your mind. You change your mind, change your thoughts, change the world. The world will change. You know, sometimes we try and try and do things where we say, yeah, man, we want everybody to unite. We want the whole world to unite. We want black people to unite. Sometimes we cast the net too wide. Change yourself. Because in that changing yourself, you will shine. People will see you and they will be inspired. And they will change if they need to change. And how can you expect something of someone else that you haven't done yourself? Exactly, exactly, so. exactly. So just do, like I said, just do what you have to do. Um, you know, and then... Um, Others will be inspired. And if they are to change, they are to change, you know? Mm. Okay, well, we're coming to the end of the podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, we've still got a couple tunes left, mm-hmm. though. Um, so we've got Linus by Midnight. Yes, so Midnight. Yes, first of all, the name Midnight. I just think, whoa, what? Midnight. Um, I'd love to ask him why. I have an idea why I'm called Midnight, but I'd have to ask him. Um, lioness. I like the way it's spelled. It's L I A N E W S. Is it? Yes, that's correct. Wow. Yeah, lioness. <laughs> that's all you need to know. You listen to the track. It's a long track, though. I think it's about six minutes. But um, yeah, again, it's about rising. Once that lioness, the woman, rises, everything in nice, everything in nature, settle. It knows where it needs to be. That's how I see it. So I say respect to midnight, and. Demand them, you know, it's not about fighting and saying for me that I am the head and I am the man and that, that, that. Nah, nah, because even in, even in where, in, with the light, in the lion kingdom, um, you have the lion, the male and the female. He has his role and it's quite small, actually. He's there to protect and do whatever. But my girl does everything else. You get me? (laughs) (laughs) She's basically running things. Mm. But it's finding and knowing what it is. Know your strength. Yeah. But the, ultimately, find the balance. Find that balance. Because together it will work as one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, here we go. A lioness yeah. by midnight. Yeah, man. Inheritance tribes. Taken into a land of traffic. Where the people regard not the person of the old. Not the young son. Speak a riddle unto the rebellious nation. And say unto them. What is your mother, lioness? Principally rock solid of an empress. When she be strong, the whole line neighbors rest. When she be storm, she literalize the tempest. Yes, yes. Babylon, you ain't even deep, no. Deep a manipulation to scatter the nets. Concept of the demon mother with son fatherless. And any day she put to the test. Every day she put to the test. But who, 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 who can find a virtuous woman? Who can find a virtuous woman? 
Her loyalty is the priceless. She deliver right to no beast confess. Lioness, yes, yes. Lioness, ah uh ah. -uh. Principally rock solid love and empress. When she be strong, the whole universe rests. When she be strong, she literalized the I tempest. have one final question, but I really don't want it to end because like, you're just a fountain <laughs> of knowledge and light and oh my gosh. Um, it's in a reflection. This is a reflection. So as you're telling me this, it's coming both ways. It's from both ways. Oh, thank you. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Um, what legacy would you like to leave behind? Leaving this world, you'd be happy as long as... Well, even to this point, I say I would say that I have done things that I am proud of um, and that people um, have been inspired by. Um, like I said, as a family support worker, you know, the work that I did working with those families to know when I look at them, look at those families, those children who are now grown or growing up, that I had a part in their life that was something very positive. The same with my own children, you know? Um, so I'm the type of person that if I've learned something, I'm, I'm quite willing to share it. Quite willing to share it. Um, I think it would help me. Um, and I'm also someone that, I thought, yes, I get things wrong sometimes or this didn't quite work out, but I try and learn from it, you know? Um, but it's a journey. You know, and we're constantly learning and developing. So I would say that um, shine your light to inspire. That's, that's the most that we can do. Yeah, for me anyway. Definitely, most definitely. Um, thank you so much for being a guest here at <laughs> thank Reggae you. Uprising. Yeah, Reggae Uprising. Yes. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I've loved every minute and hopefully you won't mind coming back because I know you've oh, got please. plenty of work yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you've got going on and mm. plenty more things that I want to talk to you about but mm. there's not enough time. Mm. Um, so we're going to finish off this Reggae Uprising mm -hmm. with the beautiful spiritual and enlightened and enlightening Sue Brown with a song called Blessed is the Man by Kabaka Pyramid mm. featuring Chronics. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. What would you like to say about this final track? Um, what I like about reggae in particular is the collaboration. I love when all the different artists come together on a track and this track does that. So Kabaka Pyramid and um, Chronics and all of them that are in there. And just to hear their voices together, I find it always inspiring. Yeah, there could have been a few female voices in there too. Uh, <laughs> you know, let's say that they were on the production side. That's cool still. But I love that kind of energy. Absolutely. And it, it tends to happen more in reggae and hip hop. You know what I'm saying? As a people, we tend to do those kind of collaborations more so than any other genres. And I, I just love it. So I love that. That's it. Okay, great. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, here we go with Blessed is a Man by Kabaka Pyramid featuring Chronics. Mm -hmm. I hope everybody has enjoyed the Reggae Uprising podcast. Blessed love to all the Reggae Uprising family out there. Make sure you check out all of the links because there are going to be plenty of links <laughs> in this description. <laughs> most definitely. Have a wonderful week and I'll see you very, very soon. Blessed Love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the voice of the most I jarrah so far I call him. Remember I tell ya, blessed is the man, blessed is the last Remember I tell ya, blessed is the man, blessed is the last Ethiopia stretched both her hands and gave us the redeemer of all man. Defender of the faith and that Ethiopian is the captain, the chief field marshal sergeant. Bowing at his feet, empty two nations, Ras Makonen, Ras Crown, conquering lion. A barber, Janai, father of Africans with impressed men, and I stand at his right hand.